Good evening, Dungeon Masters, I'm Baron de Rob. I get asked quite a number of questions in the comments section. Questions like, is Baron de Rob your real name? What are your favorite RPGs? Or how do you run traps? Good traps are obviously signposted, extremely dangerous, and are simple enough to be clearly explained with words. Clear, simple, and dangerous are paramount. Silly, save, or suck traps like rocks fall, everyone dies are a waste of time. What is your favorite mechanic from any RPG? Advantage and disadvantage. It's way more fun to roll two dice than having a plus four bonus, which is the old school way of doing it. What is your day job and does it help with your RPG experience? My full time job title is Digital Marketing Data Architect. I work with marketing data systems and have constructed AI to enhance user interaction. It doesn't really help with my D&D games, but it definitely has made me a better content creator. What is one book you think every human should read? How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And you should read it at least once every seven years. No matter your profession, there are no skills more fundamental to your success than interpersonal skills, and that book is a masterclass in their development. What are your house rules when you play D&D? I actually try not to house rule too much because I find the rules as written as part of a social contract my players agree to when we agree on a rule set. My rare exception to this is gold spent as XP gained when playing 5th edition. What is your favorite indie RPG? That's a toss up between Mouse Reader and Mothership. Cairn and Index Card RPG get honorable mentions though. Any tips on converting your 5e players to OSE? Yes, tell them they're playing OSE in the next campaign. The one mini-maxer who complains the loudest will get over it when he realizes their obstinance is getting in the way of hanging out with their friends. It's your right as Dungeon Master to assert what rule set you will use as DM. When you tell them, be polite about it and give them a few months warning so that it can sink in. What three books would you recommend for folks wanting to get started with geopolitics? Peter Zion's Disunited Nations to get a crash course primer on the geopolitics of our modern world, Mark Kurlansky's Salt, A World History to understand how a single resource can have long-lasting and evolving effects on society, and Robert K. Plans, The Revenge of Geography to demonstrate why geography plays the most fundamental role in societal development. What is the most important thing to incorporate in your world building to make it feel more real? Groups of people who have similar problems and ideologically disagree on the solution. I'm planning a campaign focusing on Asian mythology. Any geopolitical tips? Yunsu in the Purple Land is great for getting an East Asia vibe. I especially love Yunsu because the lore is designed to emerge based on rolling on random tables rather than just reading the book. So you can hypothetically run the campaign setting multiple times and it will feel like you're in Indo-Burma or the First Island Chain or the Northern Chinese Plain or even the Himalayan Steppe, but it will feel totally different each time you play play, which reflects the diversity of the regions it was inspired by. I'll link to it in the description. Do you have some favorite terrain features besides rivers based on how they affect geopolitics? Actually, deserts. They create amazing strategic buffers until they don't, and have no usable natural resources until they don't. Deserts are extremely dynamic depending on the technology people have access to. What is the game that you actually run the most? Mouse Ritter, Mothership, Cairn, OSC, and 5e all equally. I do want to try a campaign in Shadow Dark when the full version comes out though. What standard board games and war games would you want to try? I find almost all board games horridly boring, with exceptions being Hero Quest and Settlers of Catan. That said, I actually love Beer and Pretzels historical wargaming. The guys over at Little Wars TV publish amazing stuff, and I haven't played a game of theirs I didn't like. Their Ravenfeast Viking skirmish rules are free to download and includes a Nordic mythology add-on so you can fight frost giants and ice wolves as a band of Viking raiders. And Greg, if you're watching this, I know you might think it's sacrilege, but there is a serious need for a modern, straightforward, D&D-esque mass combat system that can be played five on one so as to maintain the DM player d d dynamic. Please reach out to me if you want to collaborate on this. How often do you get to play RPGs and what system did you cut your teeth on? I play once a week, more if I can, and my first RPG was Sailor Moon. And no, I'm not an anime fan. 
Do you think WotC will ever do Dark Sun? Probably not. With the focus on reorienting D&D's brand to be more family friendly, the vast bulk of Gen Alpha having never heard of Dark Sun or even Mad Max for that matter, the disastrous flop that was Spelljammer, and the barely lukewarm response to Dragonlance, I would be mildly surprised if we see anything other than Sword Coast or Magic the Gathering campaigns from here on out. They've already eliminated one of the most important characters from Planescape's lore, which will likely prevent the most Planescape eager part of the market from even purchasing it, further exacerbating this issue. What's the best tabletop system to run a pure Legend of Zelda game? Index card RPG, full stop. It even has heart containers on the character sheet. Characters level up and get cool abilities when they do, but the treasure they collect on the way is just as important for character advancement as they are in Legend of Zelda. Any suggestions on how to stop from flip-flopping between loving and hating your homebrew world building? Get rid of the parts that frustrate you and only put them back if it doesn't make sense without them. Just because you wrote it doesn't mean it's good and worth keeping. Apply the Pareto distribution rule, or rather, keep only the best parts of a body of work, usually the square root of its whole. If you've described 20 magic items, locations, and NPCs, it's likely that only 15 of them are not frustrating you. What's your opinion on Critical Role, Dimension 20, and other D&D streams? They are the pornography of D&D. They might be fun to occasionally watch in the privacy of your own home, but if you think it's going to be like that with your own D&D group, you're sorely mistaken. I would even postulate that the vast bulk of streams which are not successful fail to recognize that they should be produced in this way and fail because they instead capture D&D as played at home, which very few people want to watch. Are you a professional DM and what's your opinion of DMing for cash? I am a part-time dungeon master for corporate team building events. I believe people should be able to make money doing things they enjoy when their work is well liked by the community. Where do your campaigns take place and did you make a setting and how long did it take? My game worlds are disposable and I recycle them every six months to two years. World building a small region of a few neighboring kingdoms takes me about 12 to 24 hours of work with maybe an additional hour of prep every two to three months. What is the campaign idea of yours that you just haven't found the right system for yet? A hard sci-fi paramilitary horror game where fifth dimensional beings send eldritch agents into our fourth dimension of space time to mind control planetary leaders into stopping wormhole travel. Using a wormhole in the fourth dimension is like shooting a fifth dimensional creature with a railgun, and they don't really like that. What is your favorite book? My favorite I'll recommend is The Win Without Pitching Manifesto by Blair Enns. If you're any kind of freelance professional, including content creator, this is a must read. If you are a monetized D&D content creator and are watching this video, if you're interested, send me an email and I will get you a copy. It doesn't matter if you're Ginny D or Frankie D Crafter. What is your favorite dungeon layout generator? Five Torches Deep's Rubik's Cube System. When will AI replace DMs? I don't think that they will in the foreseeable future. We might get AI who can run pre-written modules on a VTT in the next decade, but that's basically just running a video game and we already have that. How many ties do you own? At least 50. Thrift stores are your friend. What's the best system for a Song of Ice and Fire court intrigue campaign? Burning Wheel. 100% Burning Wheel. What's your favorite campaign setting? Official setting? Dark Sun. Third party? The Dark of Hot Springs Island. How do you dress when nobody is looking? Collared shirt and shorts. Do you enjoy J.R.R. Tolkien's books? No, actually. I find them... trite? Sorry, Zorpazorp. When you record these videos, are you wearing matching pants? Uh, it depends on how cold it is. Do you like cigars? I don't care for cigars, actually. I prefer whiskey. Willet Rye is my favorite bourbon, and Oban 14 is my favorite scotch. Riga Black Vodka is the best vodka on the planet and has a mineral water aftertaste. People don't believe me until they try it. Drinking neat, ice-cold vodka is a Baltic German cultural staple. And finally, I've had tons of people ask me, what's the deal with Baron de Rop? is it real, if I have noble heritage, etc. And so yes, sort of, it's part of my real name, and the noble title might still have been a real thing had the Soviet invasion of the Baltics not occurred in 1940. The Cliff Notes version is that my ancestors were crusaders who immigrated to the Baltic region in 1196, where they founded the city of Riga and the Livonian Sword Order. My oldest uncle ancestor was Archbishop Prince Albrecht von Bixhoveden, and his nephew, the oldest Rop was Theodoricus de Raupen. 
Notable but more distant ancestors from House Bixhaven include Herman of Dorpat, who lost the battle on the ice in 1242, Count Friedrich, who, likely because he was an alcoholic and was day drinking, gave up the high ground to Napoleon, resulting in the loss of the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, and Baroness Sophie, who served in the Tsar's royal court and had regular disagreements with Rasputin. The Rops, however, were pretty quiet up until modern history. Notable Rops include Archbishop Eduard, who was sentenced to death by the Soviet Union for sheltering ethnic minority refugees that were fleeing Soviet persecution, another uncle, Baron Klaus, who worked as a columnist and a legal consultant for a South African think tank that assisted with writing the Cadessa legislation that ended apartheid, Baron Wilhelm, my great-great-grandfather, who was a double agent for MI6 and spied on Nazi leadership, and his son, Baron Robert Sylvester, who pioneered biomedical research with various psychoactive chemicals before they were banned in the 1970s. And I'm just a YouTuber. So if you'd like to help me make more content like this in the future, please consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a channel member. Thanks for watching, Dungeon Masters, and until next time, good night.